welcome to our workshop. Uh, thank you so much for agreeing to give a talk. And uh, I'm super excited to have you here. And uh, maybe let's start to keep on schedule. Uh, okay, hi everyone. Uh, so thanks for uh, uh, thanks you for inviting me. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about continual language learning and collaborative systems. Um, and I don't know how questions uh, have been so far. I'm happy to take questions during or after whatever works for you. Uh, I don't have very ac much access to the chat, so I might miss some. So apologies in advance. Okay, so the goal that I'm going to describe today is uh, studying learning opportunities that arise when systems interact with users. And this is an important aspect of, this, of uh, uh, deployment at scale. So when we deploy a system at scale, uh, in, in, in interact with users, there are a lot of challenges that arise, but there are also a lot of some interesting uh, learning opportunities that show up. So the talk will be divided into uh, two major parts. In the first part, I'll describe uh, the, uh, in, in an abstract terms the kind of scenarios we're interested in. Uh, and I will also instantiate those in a game-like environment called Serial Bar, which is a collaborative scenario with natural language coordination. In the second part, I will use Serial Bar to study continual learning with focus on instruction generation in this kind of collaborations. Okay, so the kind of interactions that we're interested in uh, have two agents, a, a human user and a, a system or a, a, a model that both of them uh, act in the world. They coordinate using natural language, and they coordinate using natural language. This kind of system can be a, a robot in a physical environment, a, a virtual agent in a structured software environment, a, for example, like a character in a game and so forth. As far as the language problem, this kind of scenario exposes the, uh, the full complexity of language. So you can think about uh, having to solve uh, the language understanding problem, where, for example, when the human gives a uh, natural language instructions to uh, the agent, the agent has to uh, reason about, comprehend this instruction and map it to actions. Alternatively, there is also a generation problem here. For example, consider the system giving instructions to uh, the human user to execute in the environment. So it has to uh, take its, int its internal intent and transform it into a natural language that it can communicate to, uh, to the human. So depending on the exact setup, this scenario can include uh, the full-fledged dialogue problem. Now, something that's very really important in this kind of scenario where both agents act in the world collaboratively is the opportunity for dynamic delegation. So, for example, if a, if a system, if a user asks the system to do something and the system can't do it, for example, it maybe doesn't understand the language well, uh, it can decide to delegate other things to it while accomplishing the intended task or on, the, on their own. So there is this strong opportunity for adaptation. When, even when things fail, uh, interactions uh, can continue and goals can still be achieved. And this dynamic delegation in turn allows for a continual learning where different types of learning signals can arise from this interaction that can help us in it, especially in this case, and, and learning to understand language. So for example, we can consider explicit feedback where a, a, the user might give natural language instructions to the system. And as they watch the system executing the instruction, they can give positive, uh, uh, positive, explicit, or positive or negative binary feedback. So maybe the system starts doing something right and then goes in the wrong direction. So feedback will change from positive to negative. An alternative form of learning signals come from uh, observational signals. Uh, these, are, these are signals that are often uh, implicit and don't require any additional action by any of the agents. So, for example, consider the scenario where the system wants the user to do something. So, for example, it wants the human user to bring a null. But it has a pretty bad uh, natural language generation model. And it, instead, and it says, hand me uh, the apple. The user that is collaborating with the system and wants to be helpful ends up bringing apple. And the system in turn can look at what the user did and realize it's not really it doesn't really correspond well to its original intent, uh, and maybe they they probably didn't communicate their intent. The system didn't communicate their intent well, as uh, they can use this as an opportunity to learn to uh, communicate better. Okay, so Serial Bar is a situated collaborative game with sequential natural language instruction that instantiates this kind of uh, collaborative scenario. 
It involves two agents collaborating in an environment, and a very important aspect is both of them act in the world. It's unit, it's, it allows for unidirectional natural language instruction, so it doesn't expose the full-fledged dialogue, dialogue, uh, dialogue problem. Instead, we intentionally scope the scenario so we uh, have the opportunity to apply relatively principled uh, contemporary machine learning methods. So this is how Serial Bar uh, looks like. Uh, it's, a, it's a 3D environment with uh, different elements. It has, the environment has uh, props like windmills and houses. It has different types of terrains like uh, mountains uh, and water bodies. And it has cards that are uh, distributed uh, throughout the environment. And these cards have different uh, shapes on them, different number of shapes and in different colors. In Cinebar, we have two agents, a, a leader and a follower, that act together in the world to accomplish goals. The, uh, as the name suggests, the leader decides what they're doing and they communicate their uh, goals and plans to the follower using natural language, and the goal of the follower is to simply follow what the leader tells them to do. Together, their goal is to pick up valid sets of cards. And if any of you are familiar with the card game uh, set, this is going to look extremely familiar. So the, uh, so the valid sets of cards they're supposed to, that they aim to collect, uh, they, they, what makes them valid is that there are sets of three cards where each color, count, uh, and shape are uh, unique. So for example, in, in this environment, uh, the, a valid set will include uh, these uh, two pink bars, three, this, these cards with three red triangles, and uh, this uh, card with one uh, orange square. And this, this will make a valid set, and once they collect a set, uh, and they collect cards by stepping on them, or they can step on them again to deselect them. So once they complete the set, they, they, get, a, they get a point uh, for the valid set. These cards will, the cards involved in the set will disappear, and new, three new random cards will appear in random positions in the environment. There are a number of things that we do to incentivize collaborations in the design of this scenario. Uh, and the collaboration is done using, and the coordination in this collaboration is done using natural language. So the leader writes instructions, the follower follows this instruction. But there are a number of, the, in, in, in addition to the, uh, to the natural language instruction difference between the agents, there are also certain capability and obs observation difference between them to make sure that, collaborate, that uh, working together is, and using natural language for that is something that uh, is really aligned with their goals in the game. So first of all, there is an observability gap between the two agents. Uh, the leader, they have a top-down view uh, so th this is the view that we see here uh, at, uh, at the back. They have a top-down view of the, uh, of the environment. They see the entire environment, whereas the follower has a, a first-person view. This is the, what we see at the, at the bottom right, uh, which they only see what, uh, what is ahead of them from a first-person perspective, meaning they don't see the entire uh, environment. And additionally, within the, within the leader view, we also give them the follower view, as you can see here, so they have an idea of the perspective of the follower. What this means is that the follower can't just decide and plan what to do uh, on their own. Rather, they are incentivized to follow, to follow the instructions of the leader. If they just go rogue and decide to uh, act on their own, they are unlikely to perform well because they don't have they don't see the entire environment, so they are lucky to uh, play well to select cards, and they're also lucky to conflict with whatever it is, whatever cards is the, the leader is collecting. In addition, uh, there is a capability gap between them. So the, the, the agents move uh, in turns, uh, alternating between them, and they have a limited number of moves per turn. The follower can move uh, can move farther in every turn. They have uh, significantly uh, more steps than the leader. And what this means is that the leader is incentivized not to go on their own. Because if they go on their own, they're going to uh, basically able to do significantly less, and they won't use uh, much of their abilities in the game, and they'll perform much worse. Okay, let's look at a small example from uh, from Serial Bus. So this is actually a, a small uh, Kind of like a snapshot from a gameplay between uh, with two agents. The uh, the leader is uh, the colorful figure on the 
uh, on the right here. And I don't know if you can see my mouse, but I'll, I'll assume you can't. Um, is at the top right, and the follower is the more chromatic figure on uh, the bottom left. Together, they're going to collect a set of cards. In this case, the leader is controlled by a human, and the follower is controlled by a machine learning model that we learned through interaction with users. So we did the first thing that the follower is going to do is going, they're going to plan what cards they want to, uh, to select. So they are going to select the same set that example set we showed earlier. And in their, this is their turn. So they're going to turn around, turn and pick these like, two uh, pink bars that are, is close to them. And now they want to delegate a uh, card selection tasks to the follower. So they're going to write an instruction. And the first instruction they write is turn around and, and get the red triangle next to uh, next to the mountain. So they want the follower to uh, to pick up the card. If you just if you just look above the follower, you see the three red triangles. So you're going to send this, and then because they also want to uh, pick an, the, the follower to pick the next card, they also say then get the orange the, the orange card. This basically means this they're sending the the follower to collect the the orange square card, which is just above the the windmill. As the uh, follower now the follower turn and they start by executing the instruction. The mo this is a, this is model inference. So the uh, fo the follower in this case is correctly following the instruction. It completes the first one, and then it's and then it uh, quickly go and uh, and move to the oh, sorry videos. Okay, uh, it will quickly go and move to the next one. But because uh, there is like a another orange card in their vicinity, they're actually going to interpret this instruction incorrectly uh, and will pick the card uh, in front of them. This is going to, this creates an invalid set and that's why the cards here are marked in red. So as the leader gets their turn, they, go, they will try to correct the follower. They'll say, deselect the card uh, you are standing on. So, and then uh, so the leader will end their turn, let the follower do that. So the follower will move back and forth to do the deselection. And then the leader will ask them again, but in a more specified way, turn left and get the orange square past uh, the window. So the uh, follower will now follow this instruction, uh, in this case, to correctly pick the cards that uh, the leader sent them to collect. This will complete the set, they will earn the score, and the game continues. Okay, so this is serial bar, and before I, uh, I switch to the next part where I, descri I describe how we do learning in this scenario, uh, I'll be happy to answer any uh, any question. It's a good stopping point about the scenario itself, if there are any. If not, I'll continue. Okay, so I'll move. I'll move forward. Okay, so in the in the remainder of the talk, what I'll describe is how we use this uh, scenario to study uh, continual learning with focus on learning to generate instructions. So what does it mean to generate instructions in serial bar? So the input to a generation model here, to the, to the input should be like the game states from the leader's perspective at the leader's turn, because the leader is the one generating the instructions. And the output should be an instruction describing how the, the follower should move in the world and select or deselect cards. The first thing we need to do is, we, is the leader needs to prepare a plan, how they want the follower to move and uh, what cards they want them to or act to select or deselect. We, we, saw, we addressed this uh, sub-problem of, uh, of planning using, in, the, in this case, a very simple deterministic planner that gives us a sequence of poses that uh, depict a trajectory in the environment. And what we focus on learning is taking the world state uh, and this plan and mapping it into a natural language uh, instruction to communicate to the follower. So the generation problem is, given a world state and the plan, generate a natural language instruction. So, in this case, so here I'm depicting the uh, world state is this globe and the, and the plan is a map. And we want to take these two and map them to a natural language instruction. But slightly more formally, what we want to do is want to induce a distribution of uh, instructions X bar conditions on states and plans. 
the instructions, uh, the instruction must use landmarks because the follower has, the follower has partial observability. They only see uh, what is ahead of them, and it must be from the follower perspective. And finally, and most importantly, maybe it must ex uh, it must exactly specify the cars to select or deselect. These are the the objectives of uh, the objective in the, of the agent in the game. Now, the main question that we are focused on is: Can we learn to generate natural language instructions by observing a human users executing instructions generated by a model? So can we use this kind of like behavioral signal in response to model output as a learning signal to better to improve the model? So if we assume a, a language proficient and collaborative instruction follower, a good instruction would uh, relay the system intent well. This allowed the follower to execute as intended. A bad instruction is either inscrutable or results in unintended response. So what we can do is we can, and this is the, the, the kind of like the main learning insight, we can compare what the follower did to the leader's original intent, and we can look at how these two, uh, the, 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 the follower actions and the leader intent, how they compare in order to provide us an indication of the quality of the generation. Now this kind of learning signal uh, has some a grounding in how human use language, and there are studies in cognitive science and psychology that indicate that similar signals influence a human language degree to human language learning for various degrees. There is a very nice study from 1966 that shows that a confirmation feedback influenced convention formation, which is a form of uh, learning and adaptation uh, in, in interactions. And this is this has been reaffirmed over and over again, including uh, more recently uh, by studies in reference game, for example, Hawking and Sal in 2020. So very loosely speaking, uh, this tells us two things. First of all, it indicates that there is potential for learning signal here because humans are using this signal. And it also tells us that humans are actually expecting this kind of a signal when they're interacting with natural with the natural language system. So a system, a natural a system that uh, uses natural language as an interface and want to provide the full natural language experience in, in addition to kind of like mapping symbols, composing symbols and mapping them to system response, it's also must show a continual learning and adaptation behavior. Now, of course, there is a very important caveat to these connections here that I'm drawing to cognitive science psychology. Uh, beyond what I'm saying here, I I, I, have, I can't say much. I can't say anything concretely much more about the relation of the method that I'm describing to uh, to human reasoning, which is probably very very different. Now, this kind of signal is understudied uh, in language generation, and I'm actually not familiar with any paper that does this. It's very different than how we usually learn uh, language generation models which is usually done using supervised learning, where we have access to system input and reference outputs that are uh, written by uh, humans, and we want and we use uh, basically, and we use supervised learning to induce the estimate system parameters. It's also different from active learning. In active learning, uh, we, you know, we intelligently select examples to annotate, but then we ask people to uh, write the reference uh, instructions in our case, the output. Here we are not. Here we, the, all the instructions are generated by the system. We are simply observing their execution by human users. So humans are involved, but in a very different role than in, with active learning. This signal is also distinct for explicit feedback, which requires knowing the system intent. And this is something that has been uh, done in uh, reinforcement learning, and we also worked on it. And, and more recently, under the kind of like guise of like a uh, preference learning that has been applied to different uh, scenarios. In our case, the, the, the humans doesn't have any access to the system intent, and they, they only see the natural language that communicates it, either depending on how, how good the language generation system is. And finally, this kind of signal is a natural byproduct of interaction. So, and this is really key to allowing continual learning through interaction with users with, with almost no, uh, no overhead. So while the system is acting without any immediate, in any additional inputs, it simply allows for this kind of learning, which is a very hopefully compelling thing. 
Okay, this is, this is an overview of our uh, kind of like learning process. Don't worry about the specific details and what's happening in every box. Uh, I'm showing it here so you have kind of like a rough idea of how our process is structured. After I describe it in more detail, I'll, yet, I'll come back to the slide uh, in order to kind of like, again, uh, situate every piece in the right place. So we start by initializing our model. We initialize with GPT-2 weights to get some kind of like basic English proficiency uh, in, uh, uh, from the language model. And then, we, and then we train with small amount of uh, supervised data. Uh, this is just to get the system off the ground. And it gives us a, this generation model. The generation model is denoted as a, as a PR here, where R is the round because we are going to learn in rounds. So we're constantly going to refresh this model. In each round, we interact with users, and during the interaction, we sample from our generate we sample instructions from our generation model. Uh, from these inst interactions, we construct training data, which we aggregate over time. And at the end of each round, we do contextual banded training to uh, get a new distribution that uh, to get a new distribution that we deploy uh, to interact with users in the next round. And we repeat this process over and over and over again. Okay, so how does it look in serial bar? In serial bar, the human users are going to act as the followers, so they are the one executing the instructions, whereas the system is the leader uh, generating the instructions. The users only see the natural language and the first person observations. They don't have any access to what the system intends for them to accomplish. The collaborative goals align uh, human follower incentives with successful uh, intent communication. And this, is, and this is really important because the, the users, they, they want to kind of like work with the system together and they want to help it so they can uh, get a, a higher score. Now, the language channel in uh, bar is unidirectional, and this uh, kind of like limit, limits our ability to recover from really catastrophic cases where the language is complete gibberish. Think about like when someone tells you something that doesn't make any sense, and uh, all you want to do is tell them, wait, what's going on here? This doesn't make any sense. It, you don't want to really behave in the world in an erratic way. So what we do is we add a, a very small uh, channel for feedback to catch really, really bad cases. It's not a full, it, it, and we do it using like very small binary questions. Okay, so how does it look from uh, the human side? So this is the interface that the human followers see when they interact with the system. Uh, they have this, as you can see, they have a first person view. So they unlike the leader that we saw, the interface that we saw earlier, they don't see the entire world. And at the bottom, they see the commands, that they, the instructions that they are getting. Uh, the current instruction is turn right and go straight, pass the left, and collect the three blue circle cards. The, a uh, follower starts executing it, uh, so now it's their turn, and they're going to move past uh, the lake, uh, and they're going to see the three blue circle cards, and now they finish their turn, they're going to get their turn again, and they're going to collect it. Then they indicate they completed the instruction, and they get two binary questions. We ask them, uh, did you follow all the little commands and find everything correct? So this is perceived correctness. In order to help them, we show them an overhead view of what they did, not the, the system intent, with the, the cards that were in the vicinity. And uh, they are, and so in this case, the, uh, system, the user is going to answer yes. And then we ask them if this instruction was grammatical and well written. Again, in this case, it's going to be yes. Then the system is going to, uh, then they're going to get the next instruction generated by the system. In this case, uh, turn left and grab the black star, and then the two green squares, then the green squares. So they are going to, uh, the, the human user is going to try to execute it, so they're going to turn left, uh, walk around, they see the black stars, so they're going to go pick that up, and then they're going to continue, uh, they see the two green, star, green squares, they're going to pick them up, and then they're going to indicate they completed the instruction, uh, although they didn't really, uh, know what to do with the end there, then the green squares. So they are going to, in this case, they're going to answer the perceived correctness questions as no, but the instruction was uh, grammatical. And the interaction is going to continue, they're going to get another instruction until they uh, run out of turns. Okay, this uh, kind of interaction is going to give us uh, these uh, tuples of five elements for each instruction execution. 
The, it includes the wall state uh, from the leader perspective when they gave the instruction and the system plane. These two are the inputs to our model. And, it, and the output is the generated instruction that the system generated. In addition, we have whatever the user did in the environment, so the user execution, and, and we have the answers to our binary question, the perceived correctness and grammaticality. The system plan and the user execution, they're both actually similar in format. They're extremely simple. They're just po sequence of poses uh, in the environment. So sequence of the poses that the follower, uh, the, the, the leader aims for the follower to take or that the follower actually took in the environment. Okay, so given this kind of data, we compute training data by uh, computing, uh, by computing ex uh, uh, creating training examples with rewards. So what we do is we compare the system plan to the execution, and if they diverge, we conclude that the instruction is not a good representation of the plan, the system, meaning the system intent. However, it could still be a good representation of whatever it is the user did in the environment. If the user perceived what they did is correct, even if unrelated to the system plan. So this gives us three cases. If the instruction is marked as incorrectly grammatical, we conclude it's a bad instruction. And then we create an example that pairs as inputs the state and the plan with the instruction, with the generated instruction as output with the reward of minus one. If the instruction is correct and grammatical, we conclude that the execution reflects the instruction meaning well because the user perceives what they did as correct. So what we do is we generate an example where the inputs are the state and the execution as, a, as the uh, input to the model, so it's taking the place of the plan paired with generated instruction with the reward of plus one. And finally, if the uh, plan uh, roughly equals the execution, then we say that the instruction accurately communicates the plan, and we create and we create an example pairing the, the actual inputs, the state and the plan, with the generated instruction and the reward of plus one. Okay, so this training data, um, this training data gives the training that we get basically is made out of inputs, state, and post sequences paired with a, the output instructions generated by the, that are generated by the system with a binary reward. Then. And this creates a contextual bandit learning scenario, and that's good because it's relatively a data efficient. A, a, it's a very, relatively data efficient scenario. So how do we have a contextual band scenario here? So the context, uh, as this is going to be the model inputs, it's going to be the state and the pose sequence. And the, in, in bandits, we have basically a single decision rather than a sequence of decisions. The bandit decision is the complete instruction. So rather than thinking of modeling the, the, the sequential process of generating the instruction, we treat the entire instruction as a single instruction because we can only get reward for the complete uh, instruction. The advantage of that is that bandit approaches often uh, reduce to something that looks very much like supervised learning. And this is good because uh, in neural network land, we know how to do supervised. There's one thing we know how to do well is supervised learning. But it's not exactly like supervised learning because the data, and this is really a very critical distinction, comes from the interaction with users. Uh, now there is work. Um, much of it from uh, Microsoft Research actually, uh, showing that contextual bandit is relatively data efficient compared to uh, reinforcement learning. This is more theoretical work. And this is especially important uh, in complex uh, in complex and large state spaces, for example, like a like instruction following. It's also crucial when learning from human edge, edge interaction because there is like a, a, a very high data cost. Uh, because each data point that you're going to get includes an interaction with a human. Now, another, adva another advantage in our case, the objective is going to behave actually very similar to a supervised learning problem. Specifically, it's going to uh, look in many cases just like a, a maximum entropy teacher forcing a objective that we use to, to train a generation systems for in supervised learning. 
Okay, so the, so for our objective is to maximize the reward, and uh, we're going to use policy gradient. So the gradient that we are going to get uh, looks somewhat like this. We have a, a reward uh, of y, uh, and then we have the gradient of the log probability of uh, the instruction conditioned on the state and the post sequence. Positive examples, if you kind of like uh, put a plus one instead of the y, you can see that they behave exactly like supervised learning. Uh, for uh, with teacher forcing. Negative examples are a bit different there, and they create this kind of, and they create this uh, kind of like tricky behavior. Because as you push the probability of an instruction to zero, which is what you would like to do with negative examples, the log probability is going to go to minus infinity, and this means that the magnitude uh, of these example of these examples is un is the loss is unbounded, and it's going to become larger and larger overtaking the overall objective and basically uh, killing the learning. What we do is very simple. We adopt a, an approach uh, that is used for debiasing, actually, from, in the, from the Banit literature in, in some uh, RL algorithm called uh, inverse propensity scoring. And we add this IPS coefficient only to negative examples. So now uh, we add a coefficient, uh, a coefficient to our gradient here, Ly. Uh, for positive examples, Ly is going to be uh, equals to one, but for examples with a negative reward, it's going to be equal to the current probability uh, divided by the, the probability when the instruction uh, was a uh, sample. And as we push the, push the probability down to zero, this uh, ratio is going down, will go down to zero, and will basically uh, eliminate the impact of that uh, example on the overall uh, loss. Okay, so now we can go back to this diagram that I showed earlier, and we have a better idea of what's going on in each of the pieces. So when we initialize, we start with GPT-2.8 and, and some a small amount of supervised data. Then we're going to interact with the results in rounds. In each round, we deploy our generation models, and we sample instructions from our probability distribution when we're interacting with users. From these interactions, we are con con we're going to get these tuples of like five elements, and we construct and compute rewards to get our training data that we aggregate over time, and then we do contextual bandit training to get a new probability distribution, but we deploy in the next round and so forth. Okay, very briefly about our model. It's just a single slide. It's an encoder decoder architecture, so very conventional. We uh, encode the uh, plan and the uh, state uh, as a sequence of, uh, of uh, vectors that are the, the, using some spatial encoding, and then we we consider, we take a GPT-2 and extend it to reason about the these uh, encodings using pseudo self attention. Okay, let's quickly look at some experiments. So I, our experiment is that we initialize the model using a small amount, uh, 360 with other four interactions. We evaluate a uh, user task completion and similarity of execution to the system plans using L smoother distance. So we want task completion to go up. And task completion is the users actually completing what the system intended them for do. And we want L smoother distance to go down. There is no good stopping criteria, so we just train for a fixed number uh, of epochs. So we do this long-term study where we deploy the system for 14 rounds, and here I'm showing a overall performance across all instructions. This is the solid blue line for task completion and earth mover distance. And you can see how task completion goes up, goes up for, starting from about 45%, so pretty bad system at the beginning, and after 14 rounds, task completion improves to about 80%, and earth mover distance goes down. The dashed lines are, are a breaking down the instructions according to the number of cards that the user is asked to operate on. Uh, and you can see that there is kind of like this effect that it starts, it's it's getting better at like easier scenarios where uh, zero cards, one card, and then only later on it picks up the more complex instructions where it's actually asking to operate on two and uh, three cards. A very important confounding factor in this kind of experiment is user, is user adaptation. Maybe the user adapting and the system is not really improving. So we actually, uh, at this last round, we deployed the initial system with a randomized experiment alongside the, the actual the train, system, the, 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 the train system after round 14. And the main point here is that the performance of the initial system actually remains the same. So there is, there is absolutely no user adaptation happening here. 
Uh, we also see the perceived correctness increases and the overall performance of the system, the game score all, also increases. Okay, so this concludes this, uh, this part on language generation. I just want to say one kind of like one word about a, a, a different work that we did that you look at the same, after the same problem in instruction following, and I'm just putting the results just to kind of like highlight how uh, we get similar trends of improvements in behavior uh, when you, instead of like learning to follow instructions, you learn to, uh, sorry, learn to generate instructions, you learn to follow instructions using uh, explicit feedback with a very similar uh, learning framework. Okay, so this is serial bar and this is what we did with it. Uh, and I want to conclude with like some, some, some like a very small promo of uh, serial bar two. So it's a, an improved version of serial bar that we uh, are in the, in the process of releasing. It's uh, implemented with much better graphics, uh, much better gameplay by a professional engineer. And we build it in a way that makes it a uh, much more accessible for uh, for researchers to allow them, allowing them to uh, customize the environment and the, the interaction uh, with a hopefully minimal need to actually modify any uh, unity code so a lot of the logic all the logic happening on a backend python server that that with much more granular control of what uh, the system is saying and there is a, what the system shows and there is also a lot of uh, tools to browse data and manage it and different APIs to deploy models. Okay, so I'll conclude with giving credit to uh, the students and the engineers that did this work. So the generation work was done by uh, my PhD student, Noriyaki Kojima. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of work on Serial Bar that I didn't discuss today and a lot of the game, in, uh, game design uh, approach uh, work was done by my uh, my. Uh, Ex student uh, Elaine Thor, who has since graduated, and uh, we had a lot, and we were very lucky and still lucky to work with like very talented uh, uh, engineer, engineers to help us build it. Claudia Yan built the uh, the first version of Serial Bar, and Jacob Saf is currently an engineer in my uh, lab that is building uh, the uh, second version of Serial Bar for which we see the video here. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, and. I'll be happy to answer any questions. I'm looking forward to a discussion. Thank you so much uh, uh, for a great presentation. So we have a um, discussion at the moment, and I would like to first ask the audience if everyone, anyone has a question. Hi, thanks for the presentation. Okay. Uh, I do have a question, but it's more like a, I don't know, it's more cl clarification question. I, uh, like uh, I um, let the slide where you actually reweight the gradient for the negative kind of reward was a bit fast, and I was wondering if you could spend like a uh, one minute. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. That, please. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, okay, so the, so so the problem is, is, is let's see what's so is so the problem is that if you have if you have plus one mm -hmm. here, this behaves very nicely, right? If you have minus one here, it kind of explodes because this property of log that if you push the the, the magnitude, mm -hmm. the, the P to zero, it will go to minus infinity. So what we do is we add this coefficient here. So let's kind of like see, think about what this coefficient does. Uh, this coefficient, we put it actually to equal, this, this is called the inverse propensity score. It's not something we invented. It's used for the biasing usually. I see. Uh, if the uh, for for examples where the reward is one is a plus one, we just use a coefficient of one. We don't change anything. Mm -hmm. If the reward is minus one, what we want to do is as the probability of the as we push the probability of the instruction that we sample down, which is what we want to do with the with the instruction that gets a negative reward. Then what we what we want to do is we also want to make sure it's less and less important in the overall loss, so it won't overtake the loss. So this is what this ratio is doing. Uh, the numerator is the current probability, so that's the one that we are pushing to zero. The denominator uh, is the original sampling probability, so that doesn't change. So now as we are updating our model, this quantity will go will, will go down. And the, the importance of this example will go down, and the and the explosion won't have that impact because in practice, when it's really when the value becomes very large, this coefficient is going to be zero. 
I see. And the P prime, therefore, is the model that you found at the previous round. So the P prime is the model that we use to sample that instruction. Yes, that's a model from a previous round, from one of the previous rounds, because we aggregate the data over time. So we re remember the exact uh, probability that we had. Uh, yeah, and so it's not a, it's not the, the P is of the current model, not of only not only in the current round, but you know in the middle of learning. So it actually changes uh, yeah. during one learning round. Yes. Does this help? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for the question. Um. Thank you. Anyone has a question? Um, if not, I have a lot of questions. So uh, if uh, like I actually want to ask kind of more general questions and then maybe like some of the details uh, we can leave for uh, the offline discussion. If we have time, we can continue. So I really love the setup of uh, how we kind of use the user feedback as a reward. Have you ever thought of uh, extending uh, like uh, some subs and some down? Actually, the uh, as if kind of when the user give a feedback in natural language rather than um, like clear reward. Yeah, yeah, I think that's. I mean, I think it's a fantastic idea. It's definitely clearly where we would like to go, right? It's a, because natural language is much more expressive. Uh, so. But that's that's complicates the problem because then to kind of like then there is a question of how do you take that natural language and create a, leg, a learning signal out of it. So the right. most kind of like naive way to do to be and it's already hard is I'm going to take that language and I'm going to map it to a real number which I'm going to treat as a reward. Mm -hmm. This this is this in itself is is hard because there is like a chicken and egg problem here. You know you don't have to understand the language in order to uh, in order to do this. But even uh, even that approach is very unsatisfying because a uh, language uh, is much richer than just like a single uh, real value as far as the feedback. You know, so if I if the system does an instruction and you know it goes maybe uh, you know I tell it turn right at the tree uh, and it turns uh, it turns right at the house for example. So I tell it no 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 not at the house. Uh, not at the you know, not at the not at the house. You should have continued to the tree. Then yes, I could tell I could tell you. Okay, this is minus one. But mm -hmm. this is not. But it actually told you much more. I, I told you I, I contrasted trees and houses and concepts. And I think it's ex it's ex very exciting, but very challenging to think how we take this and push it into a model as a learning signal. And I don't really, I don't have a good idea how to do it, but you know I would love to, to think about it more and, and do something along those lines. Yeah, exactly. So like this is uh, kind of a ni nice direction. Uh, probably uh, you know what I'm asking. So uh, in terms of the present, uh, I will make a presentation later about igloo, and there we try to uh, kind of use this clarifying questions from the users as a signal. I like what you're saying is that when you give a uh, system a uh, correction while the system is working. So it's not necessarily the negative feedback, it's actually kind of uh, additional signal for learning. Mm -hmm. But yes, it's definitely exciting um, direction uh, for the future. I was just uh, yeah. thinking what kind of uh, thoughts you had in this, uh, in, in towards uh, this problem and maybe like some um, plans. So I think, yeah, so I think it's, I think, so I think it's, I think it's very hard. Uh, as you probably, I don't know if you noticed that with with Igloo as well. Yeah, uh, we did. <laughs> it's very challenging, and it's even more challenging with the neural network models. Um, and I think even once you get it done, it's like uh, it's it needs a new learning paradigm because when you think about it, kind of like just distilling everything into an numerical reward, uh, it's a very impoverished way of thinking about it. So so it really requires some more fundamental thinking now. With none, with more kind of like a symbolic models that are doing more, um, you know, pre-neural networks. So, for example, we had, I had this, uh, my first paper actually in 2011 uh, was I say it now it feels like a long time, uh, but uh, we basically what we did is we had this we built a semantic parser that uses uh, induces a grammar and estimates its parameters to map sentences to a, a kind of like logical queries. And there, what we did is we 
a through clarification, we we, clarification questions, we formed many, many loss signals, and they provide and these loss signals actually provided much more granular loss. Now, because we had it was a structure prediction problem and we had this like, kind of like fancy derivation, we could plug these losses in a much more kind of like nuanced way. Mm -hmm. But with neural network, it's, it actually becomes really hard, right? Because everything is much more opaque uh, and monolithic in a sense. Correct, yeah. Uh, does anyone here have a question? Or if not, I may continue. Just uh, trying to give audience a chance to ask a question. Um, well, I'll be waiting. Yes. Yeah. Maybe yeah. I have another oh, question, go sorry. Ahead. <laughs> Always general questions. So I don't know this domain, uh, so uh, so I, I was wondering actually, like, what's the state of uh, the related works right now with respect to these problems? Like, and for example, the uh, maybe application of this technology. Like, really, are there actually um, applications in robotics or stuff like that, or like? Uh, yeah. So I, th I think it's a great question. I mean, let's see. So robotics is a very hard problem. Like very, very hard. I mean, uh, so I did some work on like language and robotics, and I don't think there, there I don't think that there, I mean, I don't, I, I, I'm, okay, maybe I'm, uh, I'm probably missing something, but I don't think there are uh, real working applications for natural language with robotics. It's just, uh, natural language is, processing is hard, and robotics is just so difficult. So usually robotics, Operational robotics are either kind of like quadcopter drones that people control around or industrial robotics in factories. These things, most of them are not even learning systems. I mean, all of them are not learning systems. So I don't think that this exists. Uh, there is a lot of potential and there is an and kind of a growing understanding in the robotics community and in the HRI community about this potential. Uh, I can't say that I'm familiar with deployment of these systems. Of, of of this kind of uh, of solutions, I think it's a bit uh, it's a bit premature, and I think you know people in Microsoft also noticed that. I mean, there are like uh, there is this effort going on in Microsoft for years around Minecraft, right? Where there is idea that there is a such pot huge potential in Minecraft for a natural language interface. I mean, I think I, I mean I I find it at least very compelling. Um, but it's a, it's a very hard problem, and I think despite everything, there hasn't been like a a working prototype. Let's put it this way: it's not that familiar with. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Julia, how can I, I on, on the, on the, say on more? The, because on this note, okay. I have a question: What's, in your opinion, is like the main blocking point for us to actually move forward towards uh, uh, um? towards kind of a working prototypes? Like, is it like lack of data? Is it lack of uh, uh, existing environments? So, so yeah, let's see. So I think we need to, okay, so I think we need to, to kind of like think about scoping a lot. And we, in Serial Bar, we were very careful about this. So in a sense, uh, you know, if you can compare, if you compare like Serial Bar to uh, to Yulia's work on a, a, on, on a, a on Minecraft uh, with like the architects and the builder and the full-fledged dialogue, the, what, what underlined Igloo, uh, the Igloo challenge last year, uh, you can clearly see that our work is less ambitious, right? It's not, it's, it's intentional that it's not a full-fledged dialogue. It's intentional that it doesn't really uh, uh, have a, an opportunity to form this like increasing level of abstractions, like, you know, put a block, now put another block, now build a giant wall and put a window in the middle. Mm -hmm. These things are really, really hard, and I just don't know how to handle them. So, so we scoped things drastically, and it's intentional. It's like because this allowed us to kind of like go and deploy and interact with users and have a working system. So, if you scope things, I think we can get very, we can go very far. Now, does this scoping leave you with a compelling scenario? That's a kind of a very subjective uh, ask question. I think it does. I think Serial Bar is an example of that. Uh, but it definitely, you know, is, is a, you know, la language is so much broader than that, and dialogue is so much broader. So, mm -hmm. 
but they, but they, what we you know what we didn't see about and a lot of it is actually inspired by looking at Minecraft and uh, you know I've, I've I've been when I started my my, my job at Corner in 2015 I was like so, someone came to me and says let's do Minecraft and I tell them wow that's fantastic you are crazy I have no idea how you're going to do this I don't really have answers to that uh, but for for three years we were sitting down and trying to scope to think about Minecraft and because of and because of engineering challenges and because of the flexibility and expressivity of Minecraft, we decided just not to do it and build something uh, something else. Uh, and I, I think that kind of like thinking about the tasks and the scoping is what hopefully will allow us to kind of like scaffold our way up uh, in this process. And data, that's interesting. So. One thing that maybe came out of here, I am, I'm, and, and something that's happening in my group a lot, we are actually kind of like stepping away from supervised uh, learning and stuff like that. Uh, and we are trying to learn in interaction with users. And then you, you really need to be data efficient, but you also have the ability to derive, and I, I didn't show these exper experiments, but you have the ability to derive learning signals that are much more effective than supervised learning. And I think that's actually really important. So in a very self-serving way, I think that like uh, we need to kind of like scope things, even if it makes us look less ambitious, but there are very opportunities for creativity there. And and maybe we need to get away a bit from like corpus, corpus data and stuff like that and think about what we can do with like with humans that are interacting with our systems, uh, which also creates some really wild questions and behaviors and we have some papers kind of like showing the dynamics that people are adapting adopting sorry yeah thank you so much uh, thank you so much for your presentation and fantastic discussion i'm totally with you on like scoping down the task and trying to solve something maybe uh, like looking simpler but at least concrete and uh, that's what did the main uh, like then it can complicate uh, the interactions and try to but definitely like starting from the uh, um, more complex environment is not an answer. I believe me, I learned that. <laughs> so and on, on this positive note, I hope you will stay with us for uh, Julia's talk. So I'm super excited to uh, we actually have a five minutes break, but we a little bit be, uh, behind the schedule. Maybe we can just continue as we all here. So yeah, uh, the next is uh, Julia Hockenmeyer from uh, University of uh, Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, and she will be talking about how to new data set can allow AI to make progress. I'm personally super excited about uh, this talk because uh, the talk I will be making after uh, that was inspired by uh, Julia's work, earlier Julia's work on uh, how can make a collaborative uh, dialogues in Minecraft. So yeah, I will uh, give the floor to you. Okay. Cool. So, okay. Um, hi, I'm Julia Hockemeyer. I'm at the University of Illinois. Um, and yeah, um, I wanted to talk to you about basically something that's sort of been occupying my research sort of agenda. Actually, since I've been, a, since I was a PhD student, really, um, I've always been interested in like how data sets can, you know, sort of help us make progress. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that part. I'm going to talk about the research that I started doing in like 2007 when I, when I started here at Illinois. Um, so, so next slide, please. So um, again, one thing I'd like to say to, you know, you know, whenever I give a talk to an audience that's not necessarily just NLP people, is that natural language is like easy, right? And actually deceptively so, because human, like, you know, as humans, we cannot not understand, right? When we when we see something or read something or hear something in a language that we know, right? It's just impossible for us, right? So, so um, next slide. But so sometimes it's just sort of helpful to 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 like look at um, text in another language, right? In another writing system that we don't possibly, right? That doesn't make any sense to us, perhaps, right? Right? Because then. So the perspective that a computer has of oh, these are just like like sort of lots of symbols that appear in some some you know sort of particular order with, a, with like particular you know sort of patterns right hopefully it becomes much more apparent right than when, when we're seeing something in a language that we know um, next slide 
right? So of course, and actually, this sort of looks difficult for for us now, right? Because because we don't know these writing systems necessarily, right? But of course, if you train a neural language model on texts in those languages, right, they can do a lot with that, right? But because they're really good at manipulating sort of arbitrary sequences of symbols. Next slide, please. And in a way, I mean, AI has always viewed natural language as a hallmark of intelligence. Next slide. Um, but actually, of course, that isn't necessarily, um, I mean, like we know that that's not really true, right? We know that even though models like GPT-2 are really amazing, right, but at what they can do and how much they've pushed NLP forward, Right, um, they're not really intelligent in any way, right? There's a lot of things that they don't know, right? And there's a lot of things you can't do by just sort of pushing some walls around, right? There was a great paper by, by Emily Bender and Alexander Koller a couple of years ago, right, uh, um, where, where they talked about this as well. But the, uh, that's a very nice sort of discussion of this issue if you're not familiar with it already. Um, right, the, um, but um, just using large language models alone is is clearly not, not sufficient, right? Um, next slide, please. Right. And of course, um, uh, actually we've known that, that that sort of natural language can be a very deceptive mark of, you know, of intelligence, right? Since, since Eliza, right? Um, right uh, so this is, this is Weizenbaum uh, in 1966, right? This, this, this chatbot, uh, next animation, right? Oh, yeah. Some, yeah. So somehow all my fonts uh, uh, ended up being you know, messed up. I don't know because it's. I guess because it's not on a Mac. So, um, I apologize for that. But but of course, um, everybody who's working on AI and especially on natural language, right? It needs to be familiar with the Eliza effect, right? That basically, you know, um, especially at that time, but, but people would really trust the system, right? They would pull their heart out and like like really believe that that this. You know, you know, sort of simple rewrite system actually understood them, right? Um, and I think that's an important lesson that we shouldn't forget. Next slide, please. Right. So again, it's really it can be quite deceptive hallmark of intelligence, and, and, I, and I'm going to come back later to this uh, in my talk. Next slide. So, so what does it actually mean to know language? Um, so when you hear a sentence, right, like like people are shopping in a supermarket, right? But you actually form like like a real sort of mental image of a particular situation. Next, please. Right. So so there's a lot of things that you know are you know aren't really true, and a lot of things that are uh, true. Next, please. Right. So so there's a lot of things you know. So and that's because we have a lot of knowledge right about the world what what does it mean to be shopping what does it mean to, to be in a supermarket how, um, how does that look like what what other things are, um, are people doing in that kind of a scene and so on right and and, and um that's not really clear you know just from from, from that that string of sort of words alone right next slide please um, so, so natural language of uh, understanding, of course, requires the ability to draw inferences, right? So, so, so people sometimes call this common sense reasoning or world knowledge, right? Um, so, and the, uh, because a lot of what actually is a natural language is sort of implied, right? Because we assume that that, that if you're talking to a person who like shares a similar view of the world and so on, a, a similar background, etc. Right. Next slide, please. Um, Another, you know, so you know, way of looking at what what it means to know language, right? Again, when you hear a simple sentence like this, that is, of course, you can sort of picture like like sort of certain scenes, right? Right here, we have we've got shopping pictures that are, you know, that are not in a supermarket, um, as well as, of course, lots of other scenes, um, that could that are also clearly not correct for, or, or for which this sentence is not a correct description, and then, of course, a, a whole variety of like tech pictures that are. Right. Um, and again, this is something that's very clear, clear to us, right? So, so this is of course grounding, right? Um, by which we mean grounding in the sense of requiring the ability to like, like connect language to the world. And in this case, we assume that images are sort of a proxy to, to the world. Um, next slide, please. So, so how do you get a computer to be able to describe images? 
right? right? So this was a question that we started asking in around 2007, right? When really this was, you know, I'm like, like you know, you know, people didn't think that it was going to be possible, right? Um, next slide, please. And of course, now now it's a completely standard task, right? So, so, so when you think about like a completely sort of new task like that, but that people just haven't really, really done yet. But at that time, people were able to associate images like with, with words and so on, but like not with like entire complex sentences, right? So you need to think about what task you use, right? If you want to develop this ability, right? So if you can evaluate systems, compare them, huh? what model do you want to use? And also what data do you use, right? right, right, right? Because you need to learn this model, the scoring function that tells you how well a sentence in an image and fit together and so on, right? So, and um, next slide, please. So, so when people describe their own photos, right, um, but they don't actually describe it, what's in the image here. So what? So how would you describe this image, right? You, you would probably say there's a man petting a stingray, right? Right. But but this is not how how this person described this image, right? Um, on Flickr, which is where we got this image from, and um. But they talk about um, the fact that this was their vacation at Discovery Cove, their experience, and so on, right? They, they, you know, so this is, of course, you know, sort of topically relevant, but it's not what we need to train models to be able to describe images, right? Next slide, please. Right, so yeah. Um, and so, so, so why don't they describe the images, right? Right, well, uh, next, please. Right, right. And that's because people write for other people, right? Right. You don't write these descriptions to, to, to explicitly say what's in the image, right? Typically, because you assume that the people that are going to read this have the image right in front of them, right? But you don't want to bore them, right? And you know, and of course, linguists and philosophers have thought about this, right? Uh, you know, basically, basically, gra uh, basic um, Gracian maxims, right? You want to be informative, you want to be relevant, right? And if you just repeat what's in there, right, right you're just going to bore. For your your audience, right? right? So typically, captions that you find online are going to provide you additional information, but not necessarily the information that that's depicted in the image itself, right? So so then we um we actually ended up collecting a lot of images ourselves, and and, and we started crowdsourcing image captions, right? Um, and because because we realized very quickly that there was a, like a lot of different things you can say about the the same image, right? You basically we ended up collecting five captions per image, right? And so 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 if this looks familiar to you, um, so the, so like MS Coco, right? Uh, the, and that's another big data set that's used for um, for image captioning, right? But they um, they basically um, used um, the same methodology. Um, um, when they when they created their own data set because they had seen that that worked very, very well for us and that was a good and that we had a good data set um, and these image captions also turned out to be very useful for other things because because there wasn't a lot of sort of text right to describe or, or, like basically very simple sentences that that describe these everyday sort of activities and situations and so on right so 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 these captions have also been used for for like textual entailment type tasks. Next, please. So this is going to be very slow, like this, but okay. All right. So and of course, um, th and then you know, um, over the next few years, image captioning just took off. You can keep going. The slide is just has just a few screenshots, um, right? So um, that basically, um, industry got in, right? But everybody was doing image captioning now, and it so became like 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 the standard task, right? And you know, so and of course, the question is. This is actually a solved task, right? So, um, next, next slide, please. So, okay. So the question is basically, do these models actually understand languages or images? And so this is um, you know, um, a paper that I had with my with my student, uh, Mecca Hodosh, in like so it was work done in like 2015. It was published in 2016. Um, so it's like you know not state of the art models. Um, but I think the general lesson, right, of what we found, um, right, is still most likely true, right? So, so again, I'm, um, um, the results are not interesting because, because they're likely to be still sort of true of current models, but because that true of models that people 
ascribed a lot more intelligence to than than they actually had. Because what we so 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 what we ended up doing. Next slide, please. Was um, so we developed a whole battery of what we call binary force choice tasks, right? So basically one image, and then two. Di um, next, please. Um, two different captions, right? That that vary like systematically in one particular way, right? And we had like different. Um, basically, different batteries of tests that would test different aspects um, of image captioning, right? And and we could um, be, uh, basically evaluate different models by just um, looking which of these image caption pairs they would assign a higher score to, right? And so, yeah. The next slide, please. Right. So, and at each task, right, the, there was a systematic difference between the gold and the distractor. And uh, yeah. The next slide, please. And what we found was, so for example, one test was like we would replace P, um, the main person, like the subject, with another person and name, or we would replace the scene term if it appears with another scene. And yeah, you can just sort of keep playing it exactly. So, and what we found was basically that okay, so the models, so, so, uh, so our baseline, sorry, that was too far. So our baseline model was just a very simple bigram language model, right? Um, at the time, just over words, but right? not even, you know. No, no vectors, no embeddings, right? Uh, not even any smoothing. Um, and then we had like, like simple, you know, you know, the other models all had access to the image, you know. Um, and um, yeah, and what we found was that this, this, you know, sort of really dumb um, bigram language model that had no access to the image, right, actually did surprisingly well at this task, but but probably because because the um. The captions that we generated right, were very artificial, right? So it was easy for a language model to to distinguish the two, but but I mean, like um, the vision models actually really didn't much better, you know, than that, right? So the so here on the scene task, that's basically the only case where like, like the vision models actually do better. Um, if you go go to the next slide, um, so like if we switch people, so th so this would be cases like where you have two people, like a man holding a child, right? And then we would, and then the uh, the distractor would be the child is holding the man, right? right? Which is obviously wrong, right? And basically, um, we couldn't beat the spygram model, right? Right? And of course, fifty percent here is chance performance, right? Because you know, that just means that the that you pick random, right? You know, it's just random performance, right? So. Um, so um, um, neither model solved the task, but um, but apparently having um, having access to the image really sort of doesn't doesn't help much, right? This was one reason why, why we then later um, switched to to tasks like um, like um, like phrase grounding, where you where you take a caption or an image that you know is described by this caption, and you try to, to basically find um, like to, like where exactly in the image that that entity appears. Um, so we annotated Flickr 30K with these bounding boxes that was Flickr 30K entities. Um, I'm not going to talk about that here today, um, but I but I just wanted to to bring this up, uh, even though it's an old result. Next slide, please. Right, because um, to me this is like really um, an important sort of sort of reminder that the Eliza effect is still sort of well alive, right? Right. So so on the one hand, right. Um, so so this image captioning task, right? It turns out to be much, much easier than we had thought, right? right when we started this, when we started this, um, right? I mean, people thought this was this was completely impossible, right? Um, and and now it turns out it's actually not a very hard problem, right? And current models are much, much better at this, even and so on, right? And but I mean, like at least the systems that were around, like around 2015, right? They didn't actually understand how to associate these simple sentences with these images, right? So, um, so even though it looked like um, um, and they must have been able to understand this because they did so well at the task, relatively speaking, right? They clearly didn't, right? So just sort of one lesson. Now, just back to language, right? Um, so, so another thing that we did, but with with this data set was um, we um, we actually ended up using it um, uh, basically for for semantics, right? Um, so so it turns out that that when you have a lot of uh, different sentences that describe the same scene, right? But right, you can learn things like, um, um, for example, what does it mean to um, to engage in a conversation, right? It turns out that 
um, just reading this off of our data, right? With, um, so without any generalization, which you get from a learned model, which we also had later, um, but you can you can basically learn that engaging in a conversation, you're probably talking. When you're swinging a racket, you're probably playing tennis. When you're waiting for the subway, you might be standing. Um, when you're riding a subway, you, uh, you might be sitting. Right? When, you, um, when you're looking in a mirror, you might be shaving. When you're using a shovel, you might be digging a hole and so on. Right? But these are all probabilities that we could get f just from our 30,000 images. right? Which sort of at the time we felt was like uh, like really exciting, right? Uh, because clearly there's like a fair amount of sort of common sense knowledge, world world knowledge in here, right? And we we also showed that this is useful for textual entailment. Um, and but but of course uh, at the end of the day, um, just thirty thousand images right, with five captions, right, which took us a long time to produce, um, is clearly not enough data, right? But there's a lot more, uh, you know. Even just for just for this particular domain, right? But we don't we don't cover everything. And right? of course, there's a lot of things that um, that can't be depicted in images. Um, but even just sort of in this domain of like everyday scenes and and events and so on, um, um, you would like to have a lot more data than this, right? Um, now, now next slide. Right. So of course, um, the other thing that, that people use natural language to right, is to communicate and to collaborate, right? to give instructions, ask questions, provide information, et cetera. Right? So basically what we call dialogue. Right? And, and, and that's how I got interested in Minecraft. And so, yeah, next slide, please. So of course, um, this is also an old problem in, a, um, in AI, right? right? Everybody should be familiar with like Schrodinger's system, right? Which was around, you know, which is now over 50 years old, right? So users could, could could instruct the system to move blocks and so on, right? So that it's like blocks were also sort of became this, you know, sort of thing in AI, right? Um, and next slide, please. So and um, then, like, take a few years ago, uh, DARPA ran this program communicating with computers, and um, where they were interested in collaboration. And one of the use cases, right, was this blocks wealth use case, right? But they actually sort of wanted to revisit that, right? Right, and um, so, I, so I was part of a team, um, right, of people here um, that showed on, um, on the next slide, right, um, and uh, we ended up working on Minecraft mostly, right. So, um, and actually the way, so next slide, please. Right, so, so Minecraft is actually a great virtual platform for NLP, right, because, and and actually it's largely due, due to um, to Microsoft's project Malmo, right, so, so I was actually at, at the MSR um, um, summit, um, I forget was it was it 20, 2017, I think, when I saw Project Malmubi, and I thought, oh, finally now I know what we can do for this Bloxwell project. Um, we, we can actually use Minecraft, right? Right, and um, and then and so um, so so then we ended up um, developing like a lot of work around um, basically collaborative dialogue. Um, in Minecraft, right? Um, so, particular, and, and, and next slide, please. So, so we developed this this collaborative building task. Next slide. Sorry, it's very slow. Um, sorry, just click through here. So we have an so we have two players. We have an architect and we have a builder. But the architect has two. So, um, so if you think about this as a game between two people, right? The architect is, is sort of is shown some structure in one window, the target. Um, and then the builder just has what, you know, at the beginning of the game, just has like click this empty um, sort of world in front of him. There's like um, six different colors of blocks. So it's a very pared down version of Minecraft. Um, and then um, um, basically the two players have to communicate back and forth. Um, there's more on the slide um, about how to how to build um, the structure, right? But so the architect can see what the, what the builder is doing. Um, but but the builder only gets information through natural language, right? right? And of course, you know, they ask questions and so on. So 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 just like another example in the next couple of slides, we can sort of quickly go through them. So here's like you know, um, a target configuration for my data set was like you know. So um, next slide, please. Um, so and now here's like a dialogue between two players, right? So basically, so they talk about okay, this looks like a giraffe. Oh, sorry, that was too fast. Sorry. Um, and, and then uh, there's this back and forth conversation between them, right? So this is, you know, so um, right where the builder um, 
he had already like click on the second step where like click the bullet has already placed a block and then they ask okay where now and then make and, and so on right right but so so you so you have you know fairly complex interactions right um and and of course what we really wanted to do was we wanted to um to build systems that can perform this task right so so and again we wanted to create a data set so next slide please but but so here here are a few examples from our from our uh, our corpus, we have 150 of these, but, um, and then we ended up collecting um, um, like um, over three basically dialogues, I think per per, per target structure um, and, um, and the corresponding utterances and action sequences, right? And again, this was done on top of Microsoft's um, you know, you know, project Malmo, right, that many of you are familiar with, um, right? And um, yeah, yeah, so, and now, and then, of course, we got started trying to build agents that, that could actually um, do this task. Right, so we started with the architect. Can I see the next slide? Please? Right. So, oh, sorry, and the fonts look terrible here, but that's yeah. yeah sorry. Next slide, please. So for the architect, so so for both systems, we we first had to basically pare down the task. Right. So overall, but. If it is a fully interactive system, there are a lot of real challenges, right? The architect has to give clear and correct instructions in this constantly changing environment, right? And actually, that requires a lot of planning too, right? Because the architect needs to identify next steps. In order to do that, it needs to be able to align the target of the build region. And it needs to also adapt to like the builder's current position to know like where's left and right, where's, where's front and back, and so on. And it also needs to be able to identify mistakes made by the builder because, because perhaps it, uh, its instructions were unclear, or the builder made a mistake, right? And it should also be able to like answer the builder's questions, right? So there's so there's a lot of stuff that you know it's a very challenging task. Uh, next slide, please. It should also be able to interrupt the builder, right? Um, so this is not really a turn-based game, right? It's actually real time. But um, but initially we just wanted to, to, to focus on like the simplest task, which is we want to generate a suitable architect utterance for a particular game set in a human human game when the human architect said something right um so so it of course this, this sort of simplifies the task a lot right because we don't look at real time we don't look at overall task completion but i mean like it allowed us to get, uh, us to get started with like simple supervised learning right um and yeah the next slide so, and again, like the big challenge is really, really this world state representation, right? But, but because you've got to align these two, these two world states, right? The target that you want to get and to build, right? And so, so we purposely um, designed this world to be sort of challenging, right? We had no landmarks, right? but we don't care where on this white region you um, to call the build region. Um, you place the target structure as long as it's some uh, as it's somewhere on this region, um, but um, and it's not like a chessboard where you have like absolute coordinates or put this on like whatever C four, and so on, but, but, uh, because that would have made it um, much easier and not so um, in many ways. Um, it's a, so these are all design decisions that we made on purpose um, because we wanted to make this more challenging. Um, next slide, please. Right. And. So and we had a and, and we had a very simple model. We tried lots of things. In the end, we ended up with the really simple GRU model. You can keep going until the slide is yeah. Um, our world set representation was based on the sort of sort of block counters representation, which um, is just sort of very simple summary statistics about the difference in like the number of blocks, right? Both globally overall and like locally around like the last cell that was touched, right? But it's clearly a completely inadequate representation. But but given how little data um, uh, uh, we have to train this model, um, we never managed to like beat this with any other models. Um, we currently have some work in progress where we do beat the, this model, but um, but I'm not going to talk about this yet because it's it's not published yet. Um, so um, yeah, can we keep going? So just to give you an idea of, of like what a model like that can do is, I mean like it, so it actually gives like the, like really fluent instructions. Um, very often they're sort of block by block. Um, it uses color terms, it uses spatial relations. Um, um, they're not always correct, uh, unfortunately. So even that is hard for some reason, but it actually can't do much more than that. 
right? Right. It's really it's a very very impoverished model, and of course, in a way, um, with the kind of wealth representation that this model has, it it really can't do much more, right? It's just it's just really limited. Um, next slide, please. So then uh, we moved on. We were we looked at the builder, right? So for the builder, um, again, we try to sort of pare this down, but ideally. The builder should be able to to like um, ask clarification questions and so on, right? Um, uh, right now, we just we just focus on the ability to like understand and execute instructions, right? Um, which is sort of challenging enough, right? right? So we ignored the clarification part because you actually need a good execution model before you can even like like begin to to know what kind of questions you need to know to, to ask, right? Next. So, so basically, we want to predict the sequence of actions, like right, block placements or removals, right, that that the builder, sorry, that the builder performed at a particular point in a human-human game. Right. So here, right. So um, we're we're in a game state, right, on the left, where uh, the architect get, get, gave some instruction, but right, right, uh, actually across multiple utterances, um, and then the um, the builder has to build sort of this V-like structure. Right. Another thing that's very interesting about Minecraft. Right, is that uh, so? You can see that that on the left is like two blocks on the ground, um, and like the block, uh, I think the one to the left, right, that actually um, gets removed later um, to build this this floating structure. Right, but so the action sequences are are basically non-monotonic, right, because you've got to place blocks that get later removed, right, which makes it difficult to know um, whether you know. A particular block placement is actually um, correct, right? But because because you might need to place blocks that aren't actually in the target. So, and again, a very simple model, except that now uh, because the world state problem is much much easier, but, but you don't have to do any alignment, um, um, and because you, because the builder has direct supervision in terms of the action sequences, we were actually able to like train a CNN representation, right? Um, of the world state, and um, but otherwise, it's just it's a simple, basically seek to seek model. And again, we just use the GRU backbone because that that worked well enough. Um, we have tried transformers both for the architect and the builder, and we never succeeded to make make anything work much better than, than what we have. So so we've just sort of stuck with that. Uh, again, we really just don't have much data. Right? Um, yeah. And what can this model do now? So here's some interesting examples, right? So again, we have we have quantitative evaluations too, but but here here are just a few examples that I find like really fascinating. So here, um, right, we start off on the left, right, with these uh, three blocks on the ground, and then now place two blocks on top of the edges of the line, and then it adds two blocks. And now we ask the uh, gonna, well, well, and now the the next instruction is do it one more time, right? Um, and that's what we give to our builder, and um. And it does exactly the same as like the human. So, so you can't see this here. Um, the the top, the the um, the orange one is the um, uh, is the model, um, and the um, and the blue one is the um, uh, what the human did. Right. right. So so it actually somehow understands what do it one more time means. Right. Meaning it like, like place two blue blocks on top of the other, you know, the, um, of the line. Here's another example. So this is a bit more complicated. So, so I'm highlighting like the last block that was placed and it's sort of slightly darker yellow, right? So, um, okay, so so again, but the, uh, the direction is the next two blocks will be off the corners of each of those in the direction of the last yellow block, place one block then ask like that or somewhere else and one more block to the end of that on your side. Um, right, and then and then the, um, um, the last instruction um, is, um, and do the same on the other side, right? And, so at the bottom you see what the human builder does, right? So 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 um, so they add two blocks, right? Um, now the neural builder actually also adds two blocks, right? As you can see, um, and um, but not in the right place, right? So um, can you sort of add more? So it does like yeah, right? So basically there's um, if you think about what does uh, the other side mean, right? Right? It's elliptical. It's like um, the other side of what? Right? There's actually um, an interpretation where where the um, the neural builder's action you know, um, makes sense that it's just uh, it's a different interpretation of the other side right right because it assumes a different axis right um, yeah so um, these are just sort of some examples um, that are, 
that I find particularly interesting because they showed that the, the clearly this model has learned to sort of pick up sort of patterns in like uh, what, um, how these blocks are being placed and so on, right? So it can understand things like um, the same and, you know, do it again, and so on. Um, um, so next slide, please. Right. Um, just, to, just to finish off, we actually have um, like a little demo here. I think you can show the video. So this is, and now we plug this thing into Minecraft. Um, and um, so, so build a row of three red blocks. Right, the, um, the builder does this. I think we always start the demo uh, in this particular um, uh, cell. So now, now place two more red on top of the leftmost block. It does that too. And then um, the next instruction, two, two more red blocks to the right of the last one you placed. Does that too. Now it's going to place a block that wasn't actually in the action sequence that we predicted. It's some weird bug, uh, which is why we remove it again. That seems, yeah. Um, and then this is the interesting part. Place blue bl blocks in the gap. So it, so, so, um, so it only places one blue block, but but it is clearly in the gap, right? And um, and then so stuff goes haywire, right? So you know, so we stop it, right? But it's um, but I mean the fact that it was able to like you know sort of interpret uh, the gap, right? Is is to me pretty um, pretty interesting, right? I, I would not have expected a model to be able to like handle something like that. Right, so there's, you know, of course, both models are clearly well below human performance, right? This is, um, this, the builder is sort of, is much more promising than the architect right now, but, but clearly we, we don't actually have enough data to train more expressive models, right? Um, next slide, please. Right, so, so where do we go from here, right? So, um, so again, sort of trying to, to like take a step back, right? How do we make progress, right? Well, I mean, like, no, you know, we've made huge amount of progress in AI because we have so much raw data. We have lots of industry money, lots of GPUs, or like really clever neural architectures. Right? We now have like really robust model models. Right? We can now we have a much better handle on like the long tail um, because of that. But, but these models work like really, really well on many established tasks. But but if we really want to move forward and like move in uh, in new domains, right? But we can't work on like new problems without the right data sets or frameworks or APIs, right? I mean, like, we couldn't have done that without without the Marmo API, right? right. Now, of course, the problem is that like new data sets, right, um, can be very expensive and very difficult to create. It's slow, right? Um, especially if you wanted to, to, to create them at the scale that we need, right, but for our models to be robust. And I think as always, we should remain mindful of the ELISA effect, right? I think that's actually still very, very relevant. And I think that brings me to the end, so. So thank you. Thank you so much for the amazing presentation. Thank you sure. for uh, joining us. So I think we have about uh, 15 minutes for the questions. Uh, so uh, does audience have any questions? The audience uh, don't. I will start. So um, I think you started. Uh, uh, you can set a couple of points on that uh, before we have questions. Um, um, and I think I ask the uh, same question. You know, uh, is like, what do you think is we missing at the moment so that we can move uh, forward to make a progress in specifically this uh, interactive type of conversations, uh, especially when we talk about multimodal conversations and when the feedback is basically given in the language or like, like what's what's missing at the moment? It's very hard. So the so part of the problem is, of course, that um, we don't know what the correct interpretation uh, of an instruction is in a way, right? Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, like we have, you know, I mean, like we, you know, so um, even in the uh, in the human human data that we have, right, uh, where we just use simple supervised learning, right? Um, um, actually, the action sequences aren't really really perfect, but there's lots of mistakes, right? There's lots of, because people make mistakes, right? Um, sometimes they 
they just sort of interrupt, right? But sometimes the architect interrupts and says, yes, like that, right? And for us, that looks like um, that's the end of that action sequence when it really isn't and so on, right? There's all sorts of issues with that. Um, and, and it would be nice to be able to like get away from for, for like supervised learning because it's clearly, you know, overly simplistic, right? I mean, like, I mean, like we only do this to get started on something, no, not because we think that's the way to solve these problems, right? Um, but um, unless you have a model that can tell you what exactly, you know, how exactly an instruction should be interpreted, or if you wanted to train the architect, you had a model that, that actually, you know, sort of knew how to execute an instruction, right? But you can't really train, you know, it's, uh, it's very difficult to get like, a good training signal out. Right, I love, and what I find very interesting about um, yeah, about this Minecraft task, even though it's clearly toy, right? It's clearly, you know, um, it's a very limited domain, right? Um, is that so? I mean, like, there's a lot of tasks now in like like navigation and these like indoor um, environments and so on, and pick up the ball and whatever, right? Um, a lot of these tasks, I mean, like, are still very challenging, and of course, in a way, they're much more important, right? If you think about like household robots as an actual application, I don't think you would ever need like like a bot that can like, I don't know, place blocks for you, right? Um, but what's interesting about the blocks world thing is uh, linguistically speaking, is that you talk about, or the, um, the architect keeps mentioning entities that don't yet exist in the world, right? Right, they keep yeah. talking about, you know, now build something, right? Or, or, or they're gonna, Refer to um to substructures right that ex that that somehow the builder has to infer what they mean by I don't know the um the row or the pillar or the whatever right um but so in a way that that's much harder than you know so like like in navigation right when you get the instruction uh, go through the door and turn right past the table right um I mean like unless you're if you're like in this adversarial environment, you can assume that there's going to be a table when you go through that door, right? right. So, uh, so, so that makes it very, very different, I think. Um, what's challenging is that if you think about like actual, you know, you know, sort of, do, sort of doing like something like this with like real robots, right? But robots have, you know, you know, depending on the domain, they're going to have very different sensors, right? They're going to have very different actuators and so on, right? So I don't think it's going to be easy to train models like this that are going to be be generic, right? And it's going to be difficult again to basically start like like collecting data somehow. And like once you work with like real robots, again, you, you know. And uh, if you can't run simulations and so on, right, it's going to be hard to actually um, do proper experiments, right? I mean, you, I mean, again, once you have a simulation, you you can try to do reinforcement learning in some way, right? But it's it's hard, right? It's and like actually getting good natural language data is hard, right? Especially in dialogue, right? But, but I mean, like if you want natural language input that changes depending on the actions you perform, right? Um, I don't know how to do that without a human in the loop, right? Just expensive. Yeah. And here, like, actually, the second question I wanted to ask, and you lead towards that, like, what's your thoughts on evaluation? Because I truly believe, like, if we don't have a good way of, and also simple way of evaluating uh, the performance yeah. of these agents, uh, it's hard to make progress because then it's just hard to justify, quantify how better we are. Like just your thoughts on like what the proper way for evaluation, because you probably uh, run through a lot of um, tasks at the moment and uh, it's, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's the other problem, right? And that's always been been my, my problem with like, like caption generation, right? Um, I always felt that caption generation was not a good task to evaluate models on, especially um, and before we had, you know, you know, sort of, we could just use machine learning and then like, like in a way, blue, blue sort of made much more sense because you were really trying to just sort of mimic that, that sequence, right? I mean, like once you have like, like more sort of traditional LG models, right? That, um, right, um, you're not necessarily guaranteed to just get something that's going to look like, like whatever you have in your, you know, uh, in your test data, right, right, uh, because you can you can talk about so many different aspects of an image, for example, right, and that's always been a problem, right, and I, I don't know, right, I mean, like it's, it, you know, I think if you work 
like an industry, right? But, 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 and you can set up something where you have like real customers and so on, right? Um, so, I, so I'm actually currently participating in, in the Amazon Simba challenge, right? Where, where we're soon gonna gonna start uh, basically interacting like with real customers. We have these these agents that can do stuff in this indoor environment, um, right? And they're uh, and they're gonna basically play this on these like. like like as an Alexa skill that people can call up and so on on their devices and I don't know. Um, so this hasn't started yet, right? Um, so I don't know. It's going to be very interesting to see what kind of feedback we get. Um, but I also don't know how to get, a, you know, um, a sort of actionable um, a feedback from that, right? But I mean, like, you know, like, like an actual reward function, right? By right? like actually knowing um, how to improve the system, right? And, right? Unless you do like lots of experimentation and so on, right? I mean, like once you like really at scale, right? But, but it sort of comes out in the wash, right? Mm -hmm. which, is, which is, I guess, what you can do if you work like on like an internet search, where you really have like a lot of people right, using your system, right? Then you can do much more sort of A-B testing and so on, right? In a way that might be much harder in these kinds of kind of scenarios, right? And so it's it's very hard. It's very hard. It's even very difficult to like start creating new new data sets in new domains, right? I mean, like the nice thing about this Minecraft um, uh, um, setup is that we were able to like to like create um, a data set, right? It was uh, um, very small, and and the reason for that is actually because. Because the uh, the Malmo API right is um, is client side, not not server side, right? So we had to basically you know um, uh, uh, make sure that people had that installed on their own machines, right? right? So and and it turned out that it was too complex to like ask people to like do, uh, download a Docker image or something. We never you know we tried that that oh, uh, we couldn't get that to work. Um, so so we just ended up uh, buying a few laptops and calling people to our lab, right? Um, which worked, but was very labor intensive, right? So, 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 so you would like something that you can just basically, you know, kind of sort of stick up on some website or whatever, you know, and like get people to like play with that, with that, you know, from wherever they are, right? So you get enough input, right? But but if you have to call people into the lab, um, right, you can't do this at scale, right? You can't really really collect, you know, you know enough data. Right. Um, and I think, um, as with everything, right, that the amount of data is going to make a huge difference. Right. And unfortunately, um, this is all sort of um, on a log scale, right? So ideally, you don't just want like twice the amount of data, you want like 10 times the amount of data or, or even more, right? 100 times, right? right. But, but so, like, so, like, really scaling this up is going to be important, right? And it's, and I mean, like, Especially as an academic, that's very, very hard. But, but it's very hard when you don't have like the right kind of frameworks. And so I guess my talk was mostly I was really thinking about data sets because you know, you know, you know, because that's sort of what I've been thinking about a lot myself. But but I mean like, like for something interactive, it's also about the frameworks, right? But perhaps even much more so right, with the actual data sets. Yes, right. totally agree with you. So that's where, uh, like, we move probably from the data sense, uh, offline data sets towards actually interactive systems where we can put the users in front of the agents and actually right. like see what what they exactly exactly doing. Super excited that you participated in a Simbot challenge. Probably that would be a uh, nice experience this year. You could actually see what's uh, what's happening because. Uh, I yeah. think that's one of the limitations we have seen in a lot of uh, NLP applications is that the models are trained offline. And as soon as you move it towards the um, re in the real ap application and put it in front of the users, <laughs> yeah. uh, that's when you kind of can see uh, real problems. And I think one of the reasons to maybe move uh, forward is that actually have the exactly this experimental environments uh, available for everyone, including uh, actually the product people as well. So, because we need to have a safe environment uh, to test our models, I think, because if as soon as you put it in a product, um, it's, it's going to get really hard. If it's yes, also, not, yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly, right? I mean, it's going to be all sorts of ethical concerns and so on, right? That you, uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's hard, yeah. 
I mean, like we like we even had this in our in our image captioning data, right? Where I mean, like, like at the time we didn't sort of want to filter for anything, right? Right. But I mean, like we actually have some. You know, I mean, like something is like like described as an Oriental, whatever something, right? And you know, and at the time we thought, okay, let's just leave this in because clearly somebody used that term, right? But of course, you don't actually want to, to have systems that are going to going to describe something as Oriental, right? Mm -hmm. right? Because you know, um, um, and uh, like, like frankly, at that time, that wasn't even on our radar, right? Yeah, right. And you know, and like once you really scale stuff up, yeah, all of these things are you know sort of increasingly important, right? Thank you so much again. So sure. uh, ask uh, audience again if you have the last uh, chance to ask a question. Uh, put it in a chat or like speak up. Otherwise, uh, let's thanks yeah. Julia for amazing talk and uh, amazing discussion. Yeah, thank you. That was yeah, that was fun. Sorry, my slides <laughs> didn't work. Sorry, that was so slow. No, it's totally fine. Sometimes it happens. Uh, no worries at all. Thank you, Brittany, for uh, handling it so well. Sure. Yeah, yeah. I'm probably going to have to disappear soon. Unfortunately, um, I'm, I'm going to see. You know, I'm going to try to like stay on your. You know. For a little bit, but uh, I'll probably disappear sometime during your talk. Okay. So, yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much. So I'm uh, happy to share uh, with you some of the results uh, we were getting uh, over almost the last. So we basically were uh, inspired by Julia's work. Uh, we decided uh, we as a uh, like. A Quite a big group of people here you see from Microsoft, University of Amsterdam, University of Waterloo, uh, uh, Deep Power of AI and Matter. So inspired by this idea of um, building the interactive agents uh, which can uh, learn to solve the tasks uh, uh, as they provided the instruction, instruction in natural language, and they would be operating in some sort of environment. So. Uh, and um, we, had in in this case, consider, uh, consider a collaborative environment where the agent is trying to collaborate with the humans and try to help humans to accomplish their tasks. And humans on their end are able to express uh, themselves uh, using the natural language and provide the instructions. So we were inspired by our uh, idea that humans, so most like, let us let me kind of step a little bit back. Most of the current machine learning applications uh, still use uh, a lot of uh, demonstration to train the system. So, and uh, in our case, we wanted to understand if the human, uh, the, can we train the AI agents, which similarly the humans can understand the instructions uh, in a natural language and learn from these instructions. And in the same time, um, uh, looking into how the humans actually understand the instructions. Thanks to two previous speakers, you probably already understand, uh, kind of get uh, get familiar with the space. Is basically humans actually sometimes provide instructions that, which are incomplete. And as an interactive system, we assume uh, that the system can ask a, a sort of clarifying questions. That's how human actually learn. Uh, so there was some studies about that in uh, cognitive psychology. Somehow we are uh, not that explicit in how we teach each other uh, using natural language, and it actually makes human um, even uh, feel sort of comfortable if someone is asking a clarifying questions because it's uh, a kind of a, a natural way of continuing the conversation. And another important aspect which we wanted to cover, uh, at least for us, was like we uh, the, the team uh, Eagle team which were uh, built based on NLP people and uh, reinforcement learning people, we were trying to bridge uh, these two communities. And uh, uh, at the time, uh, as I'm coming more from the uh, NLP background and even more from the search um, web search background, I was super surprised and even the standard, different standards of how, people, how these two communities are pursuing the evaluation um, uh, methodologies. So I think it was kind of an important step towards that, uh, bringing us some difficulties and some challenges, but also some opportunities as well. So and um, so as we were led by the idea of exactly the task of so-called architect builder, where the architect has some idea in mind about the structures so that uh, Julia was showing 
and uh, try to explain it to the builder, which was trying to operate at the um, in an environment as provided here. So one of the difficulties uh, which uh, we faced as well that I was super hard uh, to find the uh, experimental tool where we can collect those data. Uh, and I will spend a uh, quite significant amount of my presentation further on like how we uh, approach that. Uh, because we need to collect this type of data at a bigger scale uh, than just uh, we, we cannot invite people at, at the lab anymore. So and uh, basically what we uh, another important um, challenge uh, we need to, uh, we faced during this competition is that uh, we need to provide a training environment uh, for RL agents if you want to have RL people present at our competition. So basically like two main things we need to uh, focus on besides all the baselines and other uh, interesting aspects that we need to provide for our participants a data set and we need to provide for them a training environment. And um, I don't know how, but apparently we succeeded. Uh, and uh, uh, we run already two rounds of competition of last year uh, and uh, this year. And I must say this year we, um, uh, much more successful in terms of number of participants and well, I will share with you further. So if you're interested, uh, there's a, a link for the AI uh, to the uh, website uh, to the AI crowd website where you can uh, go and look at the different um, um, look at how we uh, at our competitions where you can have a starting kit and um, download uh, data sets and uh, the have instructions for how to use the environment. And um, in order for us to approach the communities, they actually ran two separate um, tasks. You can even think about that as a two separate challenges, which we hope to combine in one day. And so that would be a uh, so we called RL task, so pure reinforcement learning task, giving an observation which consists of visual space and instructions. Try to uh, uh, teach uh, the agent to uh, make a step in this and NLP task. Uh, which in this year we focused on actually uh, generating the clarifying questions. Given in instructions, uh, the NLP model needs to understand that instruction is incomplete and ask a clarifying questions before uh, basically we will redirect it to the uh, RL uh, agent uh, if you want to combine it as end-to-end -end systems. And more uh, precisely, that's how the data uh, would uh, look for you. And here you can also see how agent uh, can perform in this uh, space we are providing here. Um, and um, basically taking the input, um, which is both, again, visual and instruction, uh, uh, instruction in natural language in the state of the World, uh, the NLP task takes it's kind of two step tasks where it's first uh, predicts if the uh, clarifying question needs to be asked, and then uh, we uh, gen uh, generate the clarifying question. So, in our case, uh, it's how we set up the uh, task. We don't uh, work with generative models for different reasons, including the difficulties with evaluations. And with the availability of the baselines we have, we actually formulated that as a, a ranking task. Namely, we have a bank of uh, clarifying questions and if, um, our participants first need to uh, solve the uh, classification problem of like if the instruction is uh, um, in, uh, incomplete and then need to rank the questions uh, from the bank, uh, try to um, rank the uh, one which is uh, the most relevant as a top one. So, and how we see, uh, so basically an RL agent, uh, the solution is basically taking the uh, wall state representation and uh, instructions. And instruction can be any sort of uh, uh, language which is accompany this uh, uh, move. It can be the snapshot of the dialogue, uh, uh, or it can be uh, just an instruction. And how we see it like end to end to make it actually so we call interactive builder is uh, that first you have an NLP um, component and then you can move uh, with output of this component towards the uh, RL component. And that's how what I already described. So uh, sometimes uh, again, uh, like we actually have additional studies on 
how, what kind of questions people ask the most in this particular um, games. And most of the time is uh, the clarification actually come from the location. So you need to be very precise in terms of how you model your environment. So to avoid this uh, unnecessary cl uh, clarifications. And we face the same issues uh, Julia was uh, facing is that we need to uh, run our data, uh, data collection at scale. And, uh, and the tool which were available was Craft Assist uh, designed by uh, uh, Meta. And um, uh, that's how we end up to be uh, collaborating. So basically, um, the agent you could see here is uh, just uh, the agent, which is a, a pure uh, JavaScript. So it can be uh, used uh, in Mechanical Turk or any IEO preferred crowdsourcing uh, environments, meaning because it's, uh, this environment can be rendered in the browser and users can play with that. Uh, doesn't matter where they are. So, and here you can see a simulated uh, how this voxel world was simulating the space we needed to play uh, with. So basically, it's a grid, and uh, the the agent here can uh, move different directions. It can jump. It can place blocks, and so on and so forth. And we uh, basically did our best to collect the data in a way that it's actually can be comparable with a Minecraft uh, uh, world. Another complications uh, which we faced is that if you want to collect the uh, actual dialogue. Uh, you uh, cannot assume in crowdsourcing environments that you have two uh, humans playing against each other at the same time. So we basically specify that that is a more as a sequence task. So architect comes and uh, gives the instruction, then the, uh, there's automatically generated uh, hit for uh, providing it to the builder. So different type of builder, uh, different um, crowdsourced work comes and build this uh, infrastructure, uh, build this try to act on that uh, instructions and they can either ask the questions or they actually uh, uh, build uh, the um, uh, build this, trying to follow these instructions, which end up to be building something. So, um, and that's just an illustration how uh, things uh, uh, we designed. So you basically have the step one where the uh, architect gives uh, instruction based on the provided uh, structure. And here the step two, where it's usually the builder is trying to either uh, act on that or provide the questions. So um, we um, build, uh, so we actually uh, build this and that is about to be released. So we had the paper accepted, so in, uh, we're going to release it, uh, the uh, data collection tool uh, along with the uh, uh, data set. And we also extended this year this collection tool so where the agent can be uh, doing more than just building structures that actually can provide the, uh, can do some um, um, other actions rather than just building so that we can move from just the builder to the actor. So, and uh, we were pleasantly surprised how crossword workers were uh, acting on our task. Uh, that's one of the examples of uh, like in, uh, kind of positive feedback we get from them. Almost never we got any uh, negative feed, uh, feedback about these tools. And it looks like we are engaging with this, uh, humans in a very interesting way. And this type of so-called artificial task can uh, actually uh, teach us uh, some understanding on how this interactive, uh, how we can actually uh, learn uh, uh, this in this interactive set settings in the future, where the conversation is happening between uh, the human and the humans in the natural language. Uh, and not just providing just uh, uh, some kind of uh, um, more like some up, some down uh, feedback. And as it was pointed out before in this session, it is very challenging, uh, but it's worth um, trying. So another important um, deliverables of our uh, competition was actually uh, specifying the so we called it igloo environment. But basically, it's the dream-like environment for training your interactive agents. 
So uh, this way we ensure that we can attract uh, the reinforcement learning community to solve this task. Uh, so you can, uh, so this uh, training environment is uh, now getting more and more used. So, and it looks like it's getting uh, more and more mature. So, uh, and uh, I invite you to uh, use that for your uh, research, uh, if you're doing something similar to what uh, we have been trying to solve in Igloo. So another important uh, aspect uh, which I wanted to point out is actually the environment rewards. Uh, so Julia pointed out that, uh, already in her talk is that it's not always clear uh, what is the right way to build the structure. So like in, in our environment, we try to provide different type, like you can uh, call different type of reward function to try to see like uh, what is actually happening uh, in this space. Meaning that if the structure is built a little bit further, uh, towards the center or a little bit uh, the other side uh, and like what would be the best way for you to call what's the ground truth and let me jump into some numbers uh, so the participation in the rail task this year was uh, quite significant especially compared to the previous year and especially uh, taking into account the task is quite new so uh, we just closed the submission uh, on saturdays uh, and uh, we have uh, uh, 19 working solutions, uh, which we uh, hopefully have some, some of them would be um, interesting and exciting to share. So we are working towards uh, uh, looking into this solution and see like what's, uh, what's no, uh, what kind of novelties uh, uh, our participants are uh, proposing. And uh, we can say like it's about two uh, solutions are better than the baseline at the moment. And uh, that was surprising to us that this year, actually the NLP task got much more attention. So why it was surprised? Because last year, actually, we have some participation in a real task, but NLP task was uh, not so interesting to the community at all. Uh, but NLP task was designed a little bit different. So it was architect uh, generating the instruction. Uh, so similar to what um, Julia was describing. So this year, the uh, the task was about uh, uh, kind of generating clarifying questions, and we had uh, we have 27 valid solutions. Actually, just before this uh, presentation, I checked it again, and it's uh, 28 at the moment, and 12 solutions are better than the baseline. Uh, so, and the deadline is 31st of October. So I'm still uh, happy, and I'm hoping to see uh, more solutions coming uh, through the next week. So in conclusions, so we have collected a um, significant amount of data, which, we've, uh, which uh, we will share with the community shortly. So it's already available for our participants, but uh, we're going to share more uh, after the competition. Uh, we uh, did develop the uh, tool which can be used uh, along with your favorite crowdsourcing platform. Um, uh, to uh, so that uh, you can collect the data at scale. We did develop the training environment for uh, training the RL agents. Uh, so hopefully that will also spark some ideas uh, on how those agents needs to be built. And uh, what we also find out that one of the um, important things is that we also need an environment where we can pair the uh, agents with the real humans on the fly in order to get the proper understanding if it's working or not. And uh, we are internally working on this tool at the moment as well. And I guess I'm out of time and um, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Julia. Uh, I will uh, animate like uh, five minutes of uh, uh, question answering if someone has uh, some uh, questions to ask about this uh, project. You know, here in the East Coast, it's already a little bit late, so we are slowly, but otherwise I will have some questions to ask. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, so maybe I will go ahead. Uh, I'm wondering what's the, um, sorry, the baseline in the NLP task that you, sorry, how, how does the baseline work? Good question. It's actually uh, our own work from a couple of years ago where we uh, proposed it for the uh, um, 
cler a so-called cleric challenge. Uh, so, and just we adopted it to this uh, to this challenge, and uh, I think it's just uh, so, uh, quite an easy uh, pre-trained Roberta, which worked well um, for other tasks. But uh, this year, uh, for this particular challenge of Igloo, we were. Um, so like our own baseline is only trained based on the language data and here the participant has ac have access also to the uh, visual representation okay. and even whatever steps uh, the agent were taking. So we will, we kind of shared with uh, everything with them and uh, uh, I don't want to uh, spoil uh, what kind of best solutions they're doing but they do use more than just the uh, language. Uh, of the instructions. Of so basically, this uh, world state is useful for them to uh, to uh, uh, get the best clarifying question. And the clarifying question are just asked at the beginning. Basically, they are just like uh, there's one clarifying question per problem or like uh, multiple, like. Uh, yeah. So basically, like uh, we on uh, how we collect the data. So we have uh, an instruction. And then uh, uh, users can ask a clarifying question if the instruction is not clear. So uh, this, uh, so we kind of uh, leverage this uh, to collect more and more of those uh, type of clarifying questions. And I can tell you also upfront that uh, we were trying to do the in, uh, interagreement rate uh, between uh, trying to kind of uh, replicate that. Looks like it's not an easy task, and one of the reasons why is that uh, sometimes uh, instruction can miss uh, can can be uh, misleading not only uh, from the location point uh, where you need to put this block, but also like uh, if the colors are missing uh, or some other stuff. So basically, um, it's a hard task as well. But at the moment, yes, it's one instruction and then uh, you, you know uh, label if it's clear or not. And then uh, the, uh, as a ground truth, we have the clarifying question for that. Uh, so there is a general question uh, by Osam. Maybe he can ask that question. Oh, of course. Thank you. Um, so, so my question is a bit more general about RL reinforcement learning. I haven't, I learned it, uh, learned about it briefly before, but I haven't used it in practice. So I was just wondering, like, um, based on your experience um, in NLP tasks, like, when do you think that RL would be more useful? or better than other learning methods such as um, supervised or um, unsupervised learning. So like, when do you say that this is really the, the problem that I need to pick RL for? That's a good question. Um, so uh, we did try the supervised baseline as well. So, and the, it works to some extent, but the uh, baseline we propose for uh, the RL baseline we propose uh, for the challenge actually work better than a uh, supervised one. You can also tell me, uh, and I may agree with you, it's more maybe the size of the data because, uh, and despite the fact they told you that it's kind of scalable, at the moment is still uh, we're not talking about the sizes of the data set which we, uh, um, which people use in uh, NLP space. So like, mm. uh, but. Uh, in our particular um, challenge, we didn't really force people to use only uh, RL, uh, but we provided this um, training environment so we can attract RL people. Just from the uh, log kind of logical perspective, I would like to see some uh, RL agents which would be able to understand the uh, natural language and act on this language uh, mm -hmm. in particular. So it was more like explorative uh, idea to uh, kind of um, inspire. I honestly, I honestly, I honestly really appreciate the idea of RL. I really find it very super intuitive. But I was just wondering, like, um, like learning from your own, own experience, like when, um, like when should we pick what? That's uh, that's mainly my question. But I think you you made your the like uh, you made it clear to me. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, I think we are uh, at time. Uh, you think? 
somebody has more questions. So, um, well, thanks for coming. And uh, maybe Nicola, if you want to say a few words. And, uh, thanks, uh, Julia, for the presentation. Yeah, uh, thanks, Julia. Uh, thanks to everyone for participating, uh, whether you gave a talk, you asked questions, or you just you attended. Uh, I think it was great to have all of you here. Um, really, you know, the goal of these workshops is, is to broaden uh, our research horizon and take the time to reflect on, on what interests us and, and where we want to go. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the second workshop on that topic uh, we did in, in 2022. The first one was a, uh, was a Project Green workshop. And I find with these workshops that sometimes it's, it's difficult to find out an immediate outlet, uh, you know, for what we, what we learned during the day. Um, and so that's why we, you know, we'd love to continue these regular events um, to help develop a common understanding across the, the different topics in, in that community. So if you're interested in organizing such a workshop, you know, it doesn't need to be part of the research summit. It doesn't need to be part of, uh, of Project Green. Uh, please reach out uh, to me or, or Brittany. We, we'd love to continue these conversations. Um, I, we're going to send out a, a survey soon. Uh, you, you're gonna you're gonna get the link. Uh, I'm assuming you also you know maybe want to connect with some other people in in that workshop. So of course, please feel free to do so. Uh, if you want, I don't know if you're gonna have access to the details. Maybe Brittany will know about this. Uh, if you don't, you know, reach out to us and and we'll help you uh, make make these connections. So uh, once again, thanks everyone. Uh, this was super enlightening. Uh, I, I really appreciate uh, all the talks. Uh, and um, I wish you all a, a very nice evening. Uh, take care, everyone. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you to all of our speakers who participated today. And most importantly, thank you to the I, attendees. Thank you. Yeah. And also, I'm sorry, before I forget, I'd also like to thank uh, Outreach uh, for their uh, immense help in, in setting up that workshop. Uh, Brittany, you've been you've been fantastic. Uh, so uh, thanks again. It's it's always a pleasure to to work with that team. Uh, they make it so easy to to organize this kind of event. So thanks uh, thanks to our outreach team as well.